The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. Is the reading of Luke chapter 16, verses 22 and 23. I believe within those two verses we find one of the saddest and most frightening statements that could ever appear in the Bible. And being in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments. This no doubt was an absolute shock to this rich man. So far as we know, he never saw it coming. And more than likely, his extravagant lifestyle had blinded him to the reality of the painful destiny that was awaiting him. But the Bible tells us that he died. And certainly, as I mentioned, this no doubt was a great surprise to this individual. And the first thing he experienced was the painful reality of hell's presence. The soul that he tragically neglected had now become his chief concern in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, as painful as it is to read about anyone losing their soul, I am so thankful to God this story is in the Bible. I'm thankful because this story has enough warnings contained within it that it should be sufficient motivation to motivate all of us to not to go to the very place that we're talking about in this lesson this morning. Now, I do not have to tell you that for the most part, hell is no longer a hot topic in our world today. You know that. You know that hell is no longer a prominent discussion in many of our pulpits, even in some that wear the name of the body of Christ. It's very important for us to recognize that this particular subject, hell, is even tossed around the very word itself in a very disrespectful way by many individuals today. It's tossed around and used flippantly with very little respect for its intended meaning. But ladies and gentlemen, think about this. Even there are many individuals who even disbelieve in hell's existence altogether. But the blatant disrespect and misuses of the word hell and man's preference to not even hear about the subject as well as man denying that the place even exists does not negate the reality of hell's presence, nor does it lessen the temperature by the slightest degree at all. The Bible has much to say about hell, and what I want to do this afternoon is really two things. I want to look first with you at some of the uh, changes, modern-day changes we're hearing about hell, some attitudes that have changed, and then I want to close out by looking at some biblical affirmations about hell, specifically what Jesus Christ has said about it. And what about some changed attitudes about hell? Well, certainly one of the premier uh, enemies of Christianity was the English agnostic Bertrand Russell who wrote an essay entitled, Why I Am Not a Christian, and here's what he wrote, quote, he said, I must say that I think all this doctrine, that hellfire is a punishment for sin, is a doctrine of cruelty. It is a doctrine that put cruelty into the world and gave the world generations of cruel torture, and the Christ of the Gospels, if you would take him as his chroniclers represent him, would certainly have to be considered partly responsible for that. Now, for Russell, the concept of hell was cruel and repugnant. He even had the audacity to charge Jesus Christ by introducing this cruel doctrine into our world. Now, Bertrand Russell died in 1970, the year that I was born. And I could not help but thinking that when his soul slipped out into eternity on February the 2nd of that same year, that he, he did not ponder writing another essay entitled, Why I Should Have Become a Christian. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, hell is truth seen too late. Make no mistake about it. Every person who goes there learns the truth immediately about what God has said in His Word. Now, but not only skeptics, think about this. Prominent religious organizations such as the Jehovah's Witnesses and even the Seventh-day Adventists and others repudiate the doctrine that the wicked will be conscious in hell, suffering eternal punishment. But this changed attitude by individual skeptics and even those in the denominational world, it's not just limited to them. There are individuals who are members of the body of Christ who disbelieve in the eternal nature of hell. We've already noted several instances of this. For example, in 1982, Edward Fudge produced his spiritually lethal book, The Fire That Consumes. And in that book, he contended that unrighteous people will be resurrected to judgment and then be punished for a while. He further stated that unrighteous, excuse me, that the wicked will be, quote, total everlasting extinction is the final state of the wicked, he said. Now, in 1988, F. Lagarde Smith took the baton that Fudge was initially carrying and still carrying, and he ran it. And in 1988, at this time, he was a law professor at Pepperdine. And while he was there, he gave a series of lectures on a Christian response to the New Age movement. In one of his lectures, Smith affirmed the concept of soul sleeping, which simply means 
that the dead are not conscious of what is going on between the death and the resurrection. They're just in a state of sleeplessness. They are unconscious, in other words. And he also affirmed that there will not be eternal conscious suffering for the wicked, but that the souls of men will be utterly consumed, he said. Utterly consumed. I think at this point it might be good to ask this question, why has there been such a decisive change in people's attitudes toward hell? In July of 2002, I ran across an article in preparation for this lesson by the Los Angeles Times. They featured the article. It was co-authored by Mike Anton and William Lobdell entitled, Hell Losing Its Fire in American Sermons Too Negative for Today's Worshippers, is the title of the sermon, or the article. The article begins with these words, quote, Bill Ferris believes in hell, that frightful netherworld where the thermostat is always set on high, where sinners toil for eternity in unspeakable torment. But you would never know it listening to him preach at a South Orange County Evangelical Church. He never mentions the topic. His flock shows little interest in it. And then these are the preacher's words. It isn't sexy enough anymore. End of quote. I didn't know there was ever a time that hell was sexy. <laughs> to talk about. We know what he means by that word there. Healing is the idea. The authors continue with these words, quote, In churches across America, hell is being frozen out as clergy find themselves increasingly hesitant to sermonize on Christianity's outpost for lost souls. The violence and torture that Dante described in the Inferno five centuries ago has become a cultural fossil in most mainstream churches, a storyline that no longer resonates with his hearers. The author's end quote from Harvey Cox, a professor at Harvard Divinity School. He says, quote, listen to this now. He says, there has been a shift in religion from focusing on what happens in the next life to asking what is the quality of this life we're leading now. You can go to a whole lot of churches week after week and you'd be startled to even hear a mention of the word hell. You know, it seems that for many church goers, the idea of eternal damnation has simply lost its appeal. The authors continue, quote, Hell's fall from fashion indicates how key portions of Christian theology have been influenced by a secular society that stresses individualism over authority and the human psyche over moral absolutes. The rise of psychology, the philosophy of existentialism, and the consumer culture, don't miss that phrase, the consumer culture have dumped buckets of water on hell. Bruce Shelley, a senior professor of church history at the Denver Theological Seminary, quote, he writes this, listen, it's just too negative, hell. Now listen to this statement here. Churches are under enormous pressure to be consumer-oriented. Churches today feel the need to be appealing rather than demanding. Mega churches routinely pay for market research on what will draw people and keep them coming back. Now that right there is the nutshell of why we see such a decisive change in this doctrine we're talking about right here. I mean, if the consumer doesn't want it, don't supply it. Because after all, the name of the, the idea, the goal is to get a larger congregation, and if the consumer wants something else other than hell, then let's just give it to them. Now hell will be populated with more individuals as long as they keep believing that erroneous kind of thinking. Now not just these individuals, but even individuals like Billy Graham, who's known and beloved by many individuals in this country, millions of people look up to him, and you know whatever he says is gold. I mean, if he says it, it's gold in the hearts of many individuals who just say, listen, if he, if he changes his position on something, more than likely other people are going to change their position on that as well. Well, he was interviewed in 1991. Now, he came to prominence in 1940 as a fire and brimstone, quote, gospel preacher, not a gospel preacher, but that's what he's labeled as. He wrote this in an, or said this in an interview in 1991. Quote, I believe that hell is essentially separation from God, that we are separated from God, so we can have hell in this life and hell in the life to come. But to describe hell in vivid terms like I might have done 30 or 40 years ago, I'm not at liberty to do that. Because whether there is actual fire in hell or not, I do not know. It's sad, ladies and gentlemen, that individuals will vacillate on any Bible subject. The one that is so plainly taught in the Bible is the one we're talking about right now. It's amazing. Did it, did it teach error 40 years ago on the subject? That's the first thing I thought of. If he described it in vivid terms back then and no longer does that today, he must have been teaching something wrong back then or is teaching something wrong today. 
Well, it's very important for us to recognize that. What does the Bible say about the subject of hell? What are some biblical affirmations that we can learn about this subject? You know, everything that man needs to know about hell is found in God's divine word. Everything. Therefore, whatever is said about the subject of hell that's not found in the Bible is not worth listening to. But if it's found in the Bible, it is deserving of our utmost attention and, and respect. Both the Old and New Testaments affirm the reality of hell and in, in its existence. You know, it's interesting that there are very few references to hell in the Old Testament. For example, there's one such example in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2, you recall, where the Bible says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And so it, it really the parallel passage to that is John 5, 28 and 29, where Jesus said, said Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which, which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. They that have done good in the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil in the resurrection of damnation. And so the Old Testament does address the concept of hell, but not nearly as plentiful as the New Testament does. Now, the New Testament writers spoke considerably on the Bible doctrine of hell. We don't have time to investigate all of the passages that the New Testament writers spoke about. I listed several of them in the manuscript there. But uh, I think it's very important for us to turn our attention to Jesus Christ and ask him to tell us from the Bible what he said about this subject. Because he is going to tell us in no uncertain terms exactly what the Bible says about this place we're talking about this afternoon, the Bible doctrine of hell. I think Doug McClish made a very interesting comment about Jesus and him addressing the subject of hell. He said, quote, The existence of hell cannot be denied without denial of Christ himself. Thus, the crucial, crucial issue concerning belief in hell is even the larger issue, belief in the Christ himself. You see, folks, one cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ if he denies the existence of hell. Jesus said in Matthew 12 and verse 30, He that is not with me is against me. And in Mark 8, 38, he said, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, that would include what he said about hell, and of my words, of him will I be ashamed when I return, in paraphrase that. And so you cannot be a follower of Christ and deny the reality of hell's presence. Now what did Jesus say about the subject of hell? Well, he said a lot about it. I want to give you about nine or ten things this afternoon. Number one, first, hell is a place of unquenchable fire. Now if you'll turn to Mark chapter 9 this afternoon, you'll see that five times in the book of Mark, you find this language there in no uncertain terms. Just one verse after another, Jesus describes hell as a place where the fire is not quenched. And so over and over here in Mark 9, 34 through 38, or 43 through 48, I should say, is described where the fire is not quenched. And by the way, these verses teach us that the soul will not be extinguished. Rather, it will suffer everlasting punishment. You don't have to be a scholar, by the way, to recognize that the word unquenchable here means just that. Unquenchable, not quenched. You don't have to take a Greek class to understand that, do you? You don't. The phrase unquenchable means just that. Not quenched. In Revelation 14 and verse 11 is even more expressive. It says that the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. They are not. Now in the second place, hell is a place of torment. Now if you turn to Luke chapter 16 this afternoon, the bulk of our discussion will come from the, from the narrative here of this chapter. Luke chapter 16. I think I want to make this observation because there are a lot of people who will argue the points of whether or not this is a parable or whether it's a actual literal story uh, of two individual characters who lived and died. You know what, ladies and gentlemen? I don't really care. I don't really care if it is or if it's not. What I am concerned about is this. Does this narrative teach the truth about hell? And it most certainly does. That's the only thing that really matters in the final scheme of things. Right there. You can, some of the people spend so much time talking, and it's okay to talk about it. But listen, the more important thing is whether or not this teaches the truth about hell. And whether it's a parable or not is irrelevant because it does teach the truth about this location we're talking about. And that's what we're after. The truth about what Jesus said about this place. You know the story. Two men lived and two men died. Very simple. 
And the poor man who died, Lazarus, after he died, his spirit was escorted to the Hadean realm, which is comprised of two compartments. In Luke chapter 16, it's described as Abraham's bosom there, which is just another way of saying the paradise compartment of Hades. Now, the rich man died, and he was buried. And in verse 23 there, your text says that in hell, or Hades, he lift up his eyes, notice, being in torments. You see, hell is a place of torment here, is our second observation under this second main point that we're talking about this afternoon. And so Jesus Christ made it very clear that this is a place of torment. In verse 24, his very first words, mind you, described his present condition. In verse 24, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Notice, for I am tormented in this flame. Folks, I cannot think of a more horrible way to die on earth than to be burned to death. And you and I have probably seen on television individuals who have been caught on fire, either they've done it to themselves or maybe a car accident or something. And You've seen news footage of people that have been, they're just burning. And if we recoil at the very idea, listen, you and I can't even strike a match and hold it to our finger for two seconds without recoiling from that very concept. The idea of someone actually burning physically on earth is too much to even bear. But you know what, ladies and gentlemen? As painful as that is, in five minutes it's over. It's over. In a span of five minutes, or even less than that, that person is done burning, at least on earth they are. It's over. But you're reading about a man here in Luke chapter 16 who said, For I am tormented in this flame. And 2,000 years later, he hasn't changed those words at all. That's right. At all. And we're not saying that because we enjoy the fact that he's there. He hasn't changed those words at all. He was in torment the very first time he made that statement, and he's still in torment now, and he will still be in torment throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. He says, I am tormented in this flame. And so hell is a place of torment. In verse 28, again, he describes his present location as a place of torment. And so hell, number one, is a place of unquenchable fire. Number two, it is a place of torment. And number three, it is a place where one's memory is not erased. Look at verse 25. After the rich man requests a drop of water to cool his parched tongue, Abraham responds, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. This is Luke 16, 25. The fact that the rich man, by the way, could recall his former life as well as the number of brothers he had definitely implies that one is conscious in the Hadean realm. His memory was still intact. He knew exactly who he was. He knew exactly who he was when he was on the earth. He knew it. The memory is not erased in the Hadean realm. Think about this, folks. The person that dies and loses their soul will remember the last sermon they ever heard. I firmly believe it. I believe that they will be able to recall the very words of that sermon. I believe they will be able to recall the very preacher who preached that sermon. I believe that they will be able to see the expressions on his face as he vividly tried to get these individuals to change and get their lives right with God. I believe they will be able to recall the last invitation song they heard and the man who led that song. Imagine having an eternal, an eternal memory of hearing the chorus of Just As I Am ringing in your ears. Imagine having an eternal memory of hearing the song, There's a Great Day Coming, that we sang earlier today. Or, oh, why not tonight? Imagine having that kind of eternal memory. Listen, folks, one of the most horrible things about hell is that my memory will not be erased. All of the lost opportunities will haunt my tormented soul for an everlasting eternity. I'm reading about that right here in Luke 16. And so that's one of the reasons why we don't want to go there. Not simply because of the fire. That's bad enough. But my memory will not be erased. Number four. Hell is a place of intense misery and excruciating pain for its occupants. Well, that's similar to points one and two. And so we don't really want to belabor that. But let me just say that four times in this narrative, 
hell is described as a place of torment, verses 23 through 25 and also verse 28. And really the intensity and duration of the misery and pain that's described here is graphically depicted in John's words in the final book of the Bible. In Revelation 20 and verse 10, the Bible says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And you remember Matthew chapter 25 and verse 30, that Jesus is talking about the unprofitable servant there, and how that he would be an individual who was cast into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Listen, folks. Men gnash their teeth when they are in excruciating pain. They gnash their teeth. That's the description I'm reading about here in Luke chapter 16. What an unpleasant thing to talk about. It's never, never an occasion to rejoice or even smile when a person loses their soul. But we have to talk about these things and apply these principles to our lives while we are still on this earth. Lest we join this man in this place of unspeakable torment. Number five. Hell is a place where those who occupy its abode strenuously urge others not to come. Now look at verse 27 and 28. After the rich man requests for a drop of water was denied, he then makes another request here. And notice what he says in verse 27. I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send into my father's house... For notice I have five brethren, he even knows exactly the number of brothers he had, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And so here he is trying to get a message back to his brethren on the earth, not to come to this place where he is. Ted Turner is a, an extremely worldly-minded individual. I don't have to tell you that. You know that. You, I mean, TBS shows enough television programs that are vile to even watch. And so, thank you. And uh, he is on record for saying, with reference to hell, if hell is a bad place reserved, or if hell is a place reserved for bad people, and then I want to go there so I can have one long party with my friends. Now, if Mr. Turner has some friends in low places, to borrow a popular country song, which I'm sure he does, then I can promise you this, that they are right now are trying desperately to get a message back to him not to come to this awful place. And the message really is very similar to the one we just read about the rich man trying to get the message back to his five brothers. They're saying, listen, Mr. Turner, we're not having a long party down here, and I can promise you this, when you get here, or if you get here, that party is not going to begin with your presence. We're not having a party down here. It's interesting, the only thing he said... Well, really, the two things that Mr. Turner said that were true was that hell being reserved for a bad person and the word long there. That was the only thing he said in that statement that was true. Long and bad, but no party. But no party at all. And so hell is a place that is, uh, uh, as I mentioned in point number five there, a place, let me go back here, where those who occupy it suppose strenuously urge those not to come to that place. The rich man didn't want any of his relatives with him. Let me say this to you, as painful as this might be, because all of us, I think in some degree, have loved ones who died unprepared to meet Christ. But let me say this to you because it is reality. If you have a loved one who died unprepared to meet Christ, believe me when I say to you, they never want to see you. Never. Now, I know that may be difficult, but again, I'm reading about reality here in this chapter. The rich man didn't want anybody with him. And he says, listen, please get a message back to my five brothers not to come to this awful place. Misery does not love company. He didn't want anybody with him at all. Number six, hell is a place that is utterly vacant of joy and peace. Utterly vacant. Notice in verse 25 again the contrast in Abraham's words here. He says, but Abraham said to him, son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise, Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Listen, folks, a smile will never grace the countenance of those who occupy hell's headquarters. No one will ever go to hell and laugh and joke about anything when they're there. Now, they may laugh and joke about it when they're here, but when they get there, there will be no jokes in hell. You'll never hear someone say, did you hear about the two guys who went to hell? You'll never hear that, said there. Never. Not one time. You hear people talking like that. You hear people talk like that right here on earth. 
Every time you've heard people say that, you hear about the two guys who went to, as if somehow they're going on a vacation to Branson, Missouri or something when they talk like that. And we sometimes laugh when we hear those things. But I'll say, listen, there's nothing funny about a joke like that. And let me tell you why. Let's, let's, let's read about a man who's there. And let's see how many jokes he's telling about his present abode. Hell is a place that is utterly vacant of joy and peace. Furthermore, we enjoy a peaceful night's rest here upon earth, but in hell, the souls of men will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 20 and verse 10. Now, number seven. Hell is a place where fervent prayers go unanswered. The rich man is actually praying in hell, if you look at Luke 16, as you mentioned in the chapter there, fervently praying. One can only wonder how many prayers he offered when he was on earth. One can only wonder how fervently he prayed when he was on earth. One can only wonder how fervently he prayed for the condition of Lazarus to improve. He didn't care anything about it. One can only wonder how the prayer lives of some members of the Church of Christ are deficient. Let me tell you something, folks. For those individuals within the body of Christ who willfully neglect their prayer lives, will have plenty of time to catch up on their prayer lives in this place we're talking about. So I know a person can be lost for not practicing. For, uh, listen, folks. Is prayer a command? Did Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 say, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. Listen, is it the will of God that we pray? It is. Listen, folks, Matthew 7, 21 to 23 is not limited just to those in denominational worship. We preach it like that every time, don't we? But it's not just limited to them, though it includes them. Matthew 7, 20, 21 to 23 talks about members of the body of Christ as well who refuse to do the will of God which is in heaven. They'll have plenty of time to catch up on their prayer lives in that location. He prays for three things, ironically. Verse 24, look at it. Number one, he prays for mercy. Father Abraham, have mercy on me, he says. Now, God is a God of mercy, Luke 6, 36. And the rich man desires mercy, but he failed to extend mercy to whom? To Lazarus. Listen, folks, here's the point. One cannot die unmerciful to others and expect to receive mercy from Almighty God. He cannot. He cannot do it. And so number one, he prays for mercy. Number two, he prays for relief. He desires the bare minimum just to drop. Look at it. He doesn't ask for a glass of water. He doesn't ask for a sip of water. He asks that the finger of Lazarus could be dipped in water. He just wants to lick the small amount that could be accumulated on his finger. He just wants the bare minimum. That's it. Now here's the amazing thing to me because look at the contrast here. Think about these two individuals' lives while they were upon earth and how things changed when they died. Think about it. When Lazarus was on earth, he did not request from the rich man a steak dinner. He did not request a dinner roll or some other extravagant meal. He wanted the bare minimum just a crumb. He could not even get that. Neglect. Couldn't even get it. But now the table has been turned. No pun intended. And the rich man now dies. And he wants the bare minimum. A single drop is all he wants. And by the way, listen carefully. The rich man is not all he wants. He's rich. He's not why he's lost. The rich man is lost for one reason, because his physical prosperity had blinded him to the physical needs of another human being, and that was Lazarus. That's the only reason why he's lost. And how important is it for us to make sure that we don't bypass the needs of those individuals within and without the body of Christ? That's why he's lost. Not lost because he's rich. No indication of that at all. One reason. Physical prosperity blinded him the reality and importance of someone else's needs. Here's the point. The way I treat my fellow man upon earth has everything to do with the way God will treat him in the next life. Yeah. Praise for mercy, relief, salvation of his family members, number three, verses 27 and 28. I've already mentioned it. Listen, folks, the time to be thinking about the salvation of our family members is not after they die or after we die. It's too late then. The time to be thinking about the salvation of our family members is right now. Today is the day of salvation, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. And so here is a rich man in hell who has now become a full-time missionary, but he'll never convert a single soul. Not one. He's a full-time missionary in hell. Had no concern about that on earth, but now he's seen a whole ocean of truth before him. Number eight. 
Hell is a place that is inescapable. Verse 26. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great goal fixed, so that they which pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. The word goal here is from the Greek word uh, chasm. We get our English word chasm. Notice that it is fixed here, which means you cannot cross from one place to the other. Now, man may successfully attempt an escape from prison on earth, but I can promise you this, every attempt in hell will be futile. Even the great escape artist Houdini would have said of him that even he could pick the locks on hell's doors. Wishful thinking. Dante's Inferno, he suggested that there should be an inscription above the entrance to hell that reads, Abandon all hope, ye who enter. Number nine, hell is a place that is eternal in its duration. Again, the great gulf separating the rich man and Lazarus here implies the eternal nature of their respective location. Now think about this. This is very important. In Matthew 25, 46, the Bible says, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. Now the word everlasting there is the same word for everlasting in John 3, 16, describing the everlasting life of the obedient believer. Now here's the point. If heaven is a temporary dwelling place for the, uh, or excuse me, if hell is a temporary dwelling place for the uh, uh, for the wicked, then the very same argument can be made that heaven is a temporary dwelling place for the righteous. Yeah. Very same argument. Only got one minute. Furthermore, Romans 16, 26 speaks about the everlasting God. Hebrews 9, 14 speaks about the eternal spirit. Those words right there, everlasting and eternal, and those words are the same Greek words in Matthew 25, 46 with reference to eternal punishment. Now, if eternal punishment is temporary, then, folks, we have a huge problem with the Godhead. A huge problem. Boy, did you hope this witness would love this, because it plays perfectly into the idea that Jesus was a created being, as they allege. Well, number 10, hell is a place that is completely void of God's presence. See, Matthew 6 and verse 9, when Jesus gave the model prayer, he said, You pray, our Father who art in heaven. That's one of the strongest reasons why I want to go to heaven, because that's where God is. That's it. That's where God is. Amen. Second Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9 says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven in flaming fire, rendering vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of Christ, who shall suffer punishment, even everlasting destruction, watch, from the presence of the Lord. The presence. Hell is the total absence of God, implying that hell is the total presence of everything else that's evil, everything. I don't want to go to this place, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm so thankful to God that he has provided a way for us to escape this place that we're talking about. He sent us his only begotten son who died for the sins of the world, and if you and I will believe and obey him and follow his will, we don't have to go to the city of woe that we're talking about. We can enjoy heaven. It's ours to enjoy. But hell is a real place. And really, quite honestly, it's far too horrifying to even describe in human vernacular. But thankfully, we have the necessary ingredients not to go to this place of torment. And God bless these things to our ears.